the edge of Europe stands Portugal, a tiny bastion of Christendom whose devotion to the faith has withstood centuries of religious and political turmoil. With the dawn of the 20th century, this faithful daughter of the church finds herself overrun by atheistic socialists in a continent gripped by the evil of World War I. Into this maelstrom of despair, the Blessed Mother brings heaven's message of hope to three shepherd children in the village of Fatima, a worldwide vision of peace that is as powerful today as it was then. The Feast of St. Anthony is a great feast in, in Portugal. He was a great Portuguese saint. But on June 13th, his feast day in the year 1917, a great event, even greater than his popularity, was to happen in the Cova de Iria here at Fatima. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli. Welcome to our series entitled Fatima, Heaven's Peace Plan. This was the second apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary to the three young children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, here in the Cova de Iria. Our Lady had appeared on May 13th and had asked the children to come back for six months in succession on the 13th of each month. Word had started to spread about the apparition of the children, and so a little crowd gathered as the children went to the Kova that day. They began to pray the rosary. Our Lady had asked them to pray the rosary, and as they waited for her, they prayed that beautiful prayer. All of a sudden, they saw a bright light, and Our Lady appeared as she had the first time over the holm oak tree there in the, the cova. Lucia spoke to Our Lady. She said, what do you want of us? Our Lady said, I want you to come here on the 13th of next month. I want you to pray the rosary every day. I also want you to learn to write. Finally, Our Lady said, later on, I will tell you the rest of what I want of you. Lucia, at this time was not going to school, but Our Lady wanted her to learn how to read and write. After the apparitions ended, Lucia went to school and she did learn to read and write. In fact, around 1995, she even learned how to work a computer because she wanted to use every means of getting the message of Our Lady out to the world. Lucia then said to Our Blessed Lady that there was someone who was sick and she asked if Our Lady would cure that person. Our Lady said to her, she will be cured if she amends her life. She'll be cured later on this year. Then Lucia said to Our Lady, will we three children go to heaven? Our Lady said to her, Jacinta and Francisco will come soon to heaven, but you are going to have to remain on earth. Jesus has special work for you. He wants you to be a kind of instrument to spread devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the world. And so Jesus was asking of young Lucia that she remain on earth while her cousins would be taken soon to heaven. Within three years after the apparitions, Jacinta and Francisco had both gone to heaven. Finally, Lucia, when she heard that she would be separated from her little cousins, became very sad. And Our Lady said to her, don't be afraid. My immaculate heart will be your consolation. I will never leave you. And uh, I will always be at your side to help you. So that was a great consolation to young Lucia. Then as Our Lady was speaking these words, she opened her hands once again as she did the first time. And all of a sudden, that intense light came forth again and it sort of penetrated into the hearts of the children so that they could see their own hearts as clearly as they could have seen their own image in a mirror. All of a sudden, the children saw in the right hand of our Blessed Lady what they later understood to be the heart of Our Lady surrounded with a crown of thorns. And they understood these thorns were the offenses that wicked people have offended the heart of the Blessed Mother with. And these were the sins that needed reparation. And then the vision ended. 
The main part of the message of Our Lady in her second apparition focuses on that devotion to her immaculate heart. You know, Our Lady would say that God wanted to establish devotion to her Immaculate Heart as a way of bringing peace to the world and salvation to souls. Our Lady said in this apparition also that anyone who embraces this devotion to her Immaculate Heart, she would obtain the grace of salvation for that person. At the same time, she said that she would place their souls like beautiful flowers before the very throne of God. Why do we honor the heart of Our Lady? Well, because she is first of all, the mother of God. Her heart was one that was pure. It was not ever stained by sin because of her great privilege of the Immaculate Conception. So in the heart of Our Blessed Lady, Jesus could find a place of great welcome. We have to open our hearts to welcome the Lord and who opened her, their heart more than Our Blessed Lady? Secondly, the heart of Our Lady was also a heart filled with love for you and I. She was given to us as our mother from the cross when Jesus said, woman, behold your son. And then to the disciple he loved, he said, behold your mother. So the heart of Our Blessed Lady encompasses every single one of us. We are her children. And so we should have a very special love, a tender devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Our Blessed Lady. We also know that we can learn from the heart of Mary how we can best serve God. First of all, her heart was a heart filled with humility. When the angel spoke to her at the Annunciation and she gave her consent to Almighty God, she referred to herself as the handmaid of the Lord. In other words, she was a servant. She was ready to do whatever God wanted. Didn't Jesus himself say to the apostles at the Last Supper, I am in your midst as one who serves. He gave us that example of service by washing the feet of his disciples. So Mary, Mary's heart was filled with humility. Some of the saints said that it was the humility of Our Lady that drew God to choose her. After all, the humble are exalted. Who is exalted more than the mother of God? So who could have been more humble than the mother of God? Secondly, the heart of our Blessed Lady was a heart filled with faith. She believed the word of the angel when the angel gave her that message, a message that brought about the salvation of the world because believing she gave her consent. When she went to see her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth said to her, you know, blessed is she who believed the word that was spoken to her. Uh, we too need to have faith in our own hearts. Thirdly, Mary's heart was a heart that was prayerful. How often the scriptures say, Mary pondered these things in her heart. When she didn't understand immediately, she tried to understand through prayer and reflection. We should ask the Holy Spirit to give us a heart like that, that a prayerful heart so that um, we can understand our faith more deeply, the mysteries, so that we can live them more fully, so we can be more ready to do whatever God would ask of us, imitating then the heart of our Blessed Lady. Hers was a heart filled with love, primarily her love for God, so that she placed her whole life at the disposal of God's plan. Mother Teresa used to say, Mary gave God permission. And that's what you and I have to do. In doing the will of God every day, we've got to give God permission to work in our lives. And what great things he will do when we say yes to him. Remember in his writings, St. Paul tells us that Jesus wasn't alternately yes and no, he was always only yes. And so was Our Lady, who perfectly imitated his example. Another important virtue we find in the heart of Our Lady was her great purity. Mary had already consecrated her virginity to God, and that's why she had the question to the angel, how shall this happen since I do not know man? Not only had she not been living with St. Joseph to whom she was engaged, but even after their marriage, she would not live with him in, in, as husband and wife, but rather she had dedicated her virginity to God. So Mary's purity is an outstanding sign 
for us at this time to imitate that purity according to our own vocation in life. And finally, Mary, Mary's heart is a refuge. It's a mother's heart, and the mother's always concerned about her children. So in all our needs and cares, we can always go to our mother. This devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary was so important that young Jacinta, who knowing that she was going to die soon, left a very powerful message for Lucia, who would be remaining behind of the three of them, carrying out the mission Jesus and Mary would entrust to her of spreading the message throughout the world. It will not be long now before I go to heaven. You will remain here to announce that God wishes devotion to the Immaculate Heart to be established in the world. When you go to say that, do not hide yourself. Tell everybody that God concedes us his graces through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that people should invoke her. That the heart of Jesus wishes the heart of Mary to be venerated at his side. Let them ask for peace through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, for God has given it to her. Oh, if I could only put into people's hearts the flame that is burning within my own heart and that is making me love the hearts of Jesus and Mary so much. But Mary gave us finally one special sign of her love and care, and that was the scapular of Mount Carmel. We're here at the chapel, the Carmelite chapel, that's connected with the convent where Sister Lucia is now a Carmelite nun. She's been here for over 50 years, and she always had a desire to be a Carmelite. This chapel is a, represents a lot of the tradition of Mount Carmel. Remember, the Carmelite order actually traces its roots back to the great prophet Elijah. Do you remember the prophet who on Mount Carmel challenged the so-called prophets of Baal? There were 450 of them. And he told the people, stop straddling the issue. Either you're going to choose to love and serve the true God, or you're going to serve the God of the Baals. And he said, we have to make a decision what we're going to do. And remember he said, he said, bring those 450 prophets and let them call upon their God. We'll set up a sacrifice and we'll call down fire to consume that sacrifice. If that doesn't work, I will call upon the true God to consume that sacrifice. And you may remember the story from the Old Testament where the prophets of Baal all day long were calling upon their gods and nothing happened. Then finally, Elijah said, he said, now step aside. And he told them to even fill the little area where the, the animals for sacrifice were placed, even put water there. And, uh, and then he called upon the true God and fire came down, consumed the sacrifice. So in a sense, Mount Carmel represented where good and evil are in conflict and good conquered evil. Even though the odds, 450 to one in, in terms of numbers, uh, kind of indicates where sometimes we seem to be struggling against the world, the flesh, the devil, uh, which seems so overwhelming in comparison to, you know, our own uh, efforts or with the grace of God, of course, it gives us the strength to conquer as Elijah did. The tradition then was that there were prophets, there were, there were those who went hermits, who went up into the Mount of Mount Carmel, and remained there. There were caves up there when you go up to visit Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. And the tradition was that there were hermits living there in the true spirit of Israel. And finally, when Christ came, many of them accepted Christian way of living. And so you have now a kind of transition from Old Testament to New Testament. And in the 1200s, when the Holy Land was being overridden by, by the Muslim invasions, some of those hermits migrated to, to Europe 
and uh, some of them ended up in England, St. Simon's Stock, there in England at Aylesford, received from the Blessed Mother the scapular we call the Mount Carmel scapular. But there's always been an identification of Our Lady as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I'd like to just mention a couple of things about this beautiful chapel. Uh, on my right, you'll see the lower right, a statue of the Blessed Mother holding the Christ child. Uh, of course, that's Our Lady of Mount Carmel. To the left, you'll see the statue of St. Joseph. Now, St. Joseph was a favorite saint of St. Teresa of Avila, or as she's called today, St. Teresa of Jesus, who reformed the Carmelites in the 1500s. St. Teresa said she never prayed to St. Joseph without getting an answer to her prayers. And uh, this is a strong part of Carmelite tradition. In fact, they have in almost every Carmel what they call either an altar or a table of St. Joseph. And whenever they need something, they place that request on that altar, on that table, and they pray to St. Joseph to get it for them. St. Teresa, when she entered the Carmelites, they were in need of reform at the time, but she had advanced very rapidly in holiness. She was only about three years in the community, and she got very, very sick, so sick that they thought she died. They were ready to bury her. They couldn't detect any heartbeat. They couldn't detect any brain waves. Obviously, they didn't have the technology in those days. Uh, they were ready to actually say a final mass for her and bury her. And she came out of this coma that she had gone into, and she attributed the, the cure from that coma, the freedom from that coma, to St. Joseph. And that's why when she started her reform, the first Carmel she founded, she named it after St. Joseph. So St. Joseph plays a big part in the, uh, the, the community of the Carmelites. We also see over here, this is St. John of the Cross, okay, where uh, the great doctor, mystical doctor of the Carmelites, and he uh, represents the spirit of Carmel among the men. He was the one who helped reform the Carmelite friars. In fact, he was kind of discouraged at the condition of things in the order when he first entered, and he was thinking about becoming a Carthusian. And it was St. Teresa who convinced him to stay and work for the reform of the men as she was working for the reform of the women. By the way, he was quite short, and she had his support and the support of another priest, her spiritual director called Father Jerome Gratian. And so she wrote a letter to someone and she said, I have the help of one and a half priests. Here we see St. Teresa. Am I getting that correct? No, that's St. Teresa on that side, right? Am I correct? That's St. Teresa there? Okay. That's St. John of the Cross there. St. Teresa of Jesus, okay, who, as, as you know, was the first woman to be proclaimed a doctor of the church. Pope Paul VI, who made her a doctor of the church, said that her teaching on prayer would have been sufficient. It's one of the most developed teachings on prayer for anyone to follow in their life. And we see a good example of that in the main part of the altar here behind me with the seven steps. As you know, her classic work on prayer, which she wrote toward the end of her life, uh, at the, by the way, the directive of her spiritual director, Father Gratian, he told her to write about her spiritual life, about the ways of prayer, and she was inspired to see prayer as a kind of interior journey. She compared the interior of the person to a castle, the inside of a castle. In fact, the title of the book is The Interior Castle. And she said the soul journeys by seven stages, steps, or what she called dwelling places. Sometimes it's called mansions, but a mansion would represent a separate house. But for her, it was all interconnected dwelling places. And these seven steps here represent the seven stages of the interior life, which is really the journey of prayer. We don't have enough time to go into all those steps at this time. 
but um, she was a marvelous teacher of prayer. In fact, do you know she never reread her manuscript? Now, I've written several books, wrote them, rewrote them, scratched out, took out this, added that. Imagine, she wrote by hand and she never reread the work. This, she would write this work uh, after, usually after Mass. And sisters at her canonization process testified that when she wrote, her hand moved very rapidly across the page. Now, we're not talking about ballpoint pens, huh? talking about script, kind of, you know, that type of writing with a feather as a pen. Uh, at the same time, her face was glowing. She seemed to be in an ecstasy when she was writing this work. Okay, so it really is not, this, not inspired as the scriptures are, but inspired certainly by God's moving her mind and heart to write this, okay? So a very great saint. So the Carmelite tradition is a very rich tradition. And what comes down to us is the scapular uh, that our Blessed Lady gave. If you remember in the apparition that took place at Tui, when um, Sister Lucia in the chapel at Tui saw the Blessed Trinity, the Father, and then the Holy Spirit, and then Christ on the cross. And remember, on one side, the, right, the left side of Christ were the words mercy and graces. Out of the right side of Christ from his thorns, the, the wounds in his head were coming, the drops of the precious blood falling into the chalice and the host that was there on the side. And then Our Lady was seen as Our Lady of, of Fatima, holding in one hand the rosary, holding in the other hand the scapular. And Our Blessed Lady was encouraging us to, to use the scapular as a way of protecting ourselves from evil. Remember the day that the scapular was given to St. Simon Stock and there in England was June, it was July 16th, which is the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, one of the most powerful feasts of the church. Uh, I remember a woman who was involved in, in working against the occult said that there is no feast that those involved in the occult hate more than the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel for this reason, that Our Lady promised if you die wearing that scapular, you would not see the fire of hell. Imagine how many souls Our Blessed Lady has protected from hell because those people were consecrated to her, dedicated to her, protected by her because they wore that scapular. And of course, the rosary, the prayer of doing good. I always like to say you need a good offense and a good defense. Well, your defense, your protection is the scapular. Your offense to do good, like Padre Pio used to say, he called it his weapon. He said, my weapon to do good and overcome evil is the rosary. So if you, are, if you want to enter into the fully into this message of Our Lady, be very close to her, wear the scapular, okay? Remember that the scapular was meant traditionally, they said it developed from the idea of Mary, almost like wearing a, an apron. Huh? Mary who was the handmaid of the Lord. And so the idea of the scapular was almost to imitate Our Lady. It was like that apron ready to serve. And, and so it became a sign of that, but it was a sign of dedication and consecration to Our Lady's protection, to asking her for the graces that we need. So always wear that scapular. It's a, it's a real protection. I know the Holy Father, I was reading something on the Holy Father, speaking to young people, and he said, that even from when he was a young boy, he always wore the scapular. I know I wear it also myself every day and uh, use it as something I treasure because I know Mary's protection. We need that because of the many temptations and struggles we have today
trying to do good and resist evil. So I recommend to you the scapular and of course the rosary that Our Lady requested every time she appeared at Fatima. We're going to have now then the blessing of the, the scapulars, okay, and investing those of you who have not been invested with that scapula. I'll bless all the scapulars that are here, but the one scapular you want to be invested in. What's that? Sure. The, by the way, all you have to do is have your, if you get a new scapular, just have it blessed, make sure it's blessed. If you have a lot of them and you use another one, that's fine. And then if you, those of you who have not been invested with it, please come up and I will invest you, I will put the scapular over you, okay? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show us, O Lord, your mercy. And grant us your salvation. O Lord, hear my prayer. I cry, come unto thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of mankind, by your right hand sanctify these scapulars, which your servants will wear devoutly for the love of you and of your mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel, so that by her intercession they may be protected from the wickedness of the enemy and may persevere in your grace until death, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen.